Okay, a very warm welcome to the Newcomen Society Society Online Shed Lectures. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce a very good friend, Dr. Tim Smith. Uh, Tim is a metallurgist by background, but he's renowned as an outstanding expert on the global iron and steel industry, having been editor of Steel Times and Steel Times International uh, for as long as I can remember. Before that, he was a, a university lecturer and a copper miner. Tim has been exploring historic iron making sites with the Wild and Iron Research Group for the past 30 years, including, as you'll see in this uh, uh, excellent lecture, conducting experimental smelts in a bloomery furnace using local iron, iron ore local to the Wild and local charcoal, and of course, his deep knowledge of metallurgy. Before I kick off, we're going to take questions at the end. Please use the chat function to indicate that you wish to raise a question and we will do our best to handle them all at the end. Tim, as we would say in a regular meeting, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I just hope I can live up to, um, to, to, to your description of my, uh, my career. Um, yes, as Jonathan said, um, I'm, I moved to this area uh, of the Sussex Weald about um, 30 years ago and um, immediately joined what we call the Weald and Iron Research Group. It's, a lot of people don't realise that the Weald was actually the centre of iron making from the very earliest days. It was the birthplace of um, Britain's Industrial Revolution with the first first blast furnace arriving in 1490 and this led to the Weald becoming the center of the armaments industry supplying cannon and shot to the government and East India Company merchant shipping uh, from the mid 1500s. We have a website and I would recommend that people afterwards at uh, some time have a look at this website um, we, we have um, a, a number of publications uh, which are available uh, for free viewing on this website. But also very importantly, we have a sites and people database, which is a, a great boon to enable us to, um, to, to log sites as we, as we discover them. Wheel and Iron Research Group, or WORG for short, was established 51 years ago. We carry out field programs looking for the iron making sites. We excavate sites under the leadership of a professional, professional archaeologist. We've got several professional archaeologists who are members. We operate an experimental bloomery furnace. We attend events to publicize the historic role of the wheel in the iron industry. We input data to the historic environment record. Organise visits to other sites uh, of iron making interests where structures survive. We hold two lectures a year, publish an annual bulletin and three newsletters a year, publish books. We've digitised two out of print books and we've digitised all our past bulletins. And we're presently sponsoring two PhD students with Exeter University. During a period of over 330 years, the wheel boasted 112 furnaces and 109 refining forges. And this map shows that extent of the furnaces. As you see, there's very little towards the south for two reasons. Part of it is the geology. We are running into the chalk downs of the south downs. But also there was a limit to which the iron industry was allowed to go south in order to preserve trees for the shipbuilding industry. There was a 12 mile limit. Uh, the later ironworks all had to be uh, at least 12 miles away from the coast. The geology of the Weald is essentially a mixture of sandstone and clays and the iron ore occurs at the junction between those sandstones and the clay. The Weald extends east-west for about 60 miles, 
and north south uh, anything from about uh, 15 miles to the west uh, to about uh, 25 miles uh, north south uh, to, to, to the east essentially it's that area between the south downs and the north downs if we start from the beginning this was the blueberry process and we have 690 known sites in the wheel but we're still finding i had to correct this slide um, since i last used it because we had um, 688 then and we found two more earlier this year so it's an ongoing thing we're still finding the, the these blueberry sites the sites start in the iron age which was approximately 500 bc in the uk it became industrialized during the roman occupation from about 42 to 400 ad Strangely, we had little evidence during the Saxon period of activity. So that's between about after the Romans left up to about 1066. But during the medieval period, um, which overlaps obviously with the Saxon period because you've got the Norman uh, invasion, uh, we, we, we get rather larger furnaces tend to be produced uh, in that later period up to about um, 1500 AD. This is a picture of, in fact, the second experimental bloomery furnace that we built. We're now actually on our third furnace. Um, we have a, a bit of area on the Ashdown Forest, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, again, as the name implies, a, a well-wooded area, so it's good for charcoal. It's, uh, the furnace is built of local clay, reinforced with sticks and straw. The dimensions are based on an excavated furnace, and that furnace has a hearth diameter of about 800 millimetres, and the height is 1.5 metres. Height is something difficult to assess from an excavation because, of course, the furnace is collapsed. But we can get an idea of the, um, the dimensions from parts of the walls of the furnaces that we found, and how far up the slate goes up those walls. We charge it with charcoal and local iron ore. The product from the Bloomery Furnace is a solid iron. We call it the sponge iron because it's quite, um, it's got lots of voids in it. And a liquid slag. And here we can see some of our liquid slag flowing out of the furnace. This is known as tap slag. The iron is the bloom, hence the name for the furnace. The slag is the waste material and it's very rich in iron. There's actually more iron in the slag than there is in the original ore. The bloomery process was not an efficient process for extracting iron from the ore. But it's known as the direct process as the iron can be forged without further refinement. We only need to consolidate it. It's the, 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 the carbon content in the iron actually varies. You get a carbon gradient from what we would today consider to be a steel uh, right down to what we would consider to be a wrought iron. So from something like 1% carbon content to about 0.1 carbon content. This is a picture of uh, some bloomery tap slag found in the field. It's heavy and dense, as I mentioned, it's got a lot of iron in it, it can, can contain as much as 50% iron. But that iron is now combined with the silica, which has come both from the ore and also from the furnace lining. It's a very useful hardcore material. The Romans used a lot of it in road building, but farmers use it for around gates, and later uh, Victorians have used it for road building, uh, for road building uh, and it's a good foundation for housing and so forth. So the problem is that it's very difficult to assess the size of a bloomery site because nearly all of them have been robbed with a high, high proportion of that slag. But it is the slag that we're looking for when we're looking for the sites of the furnaces. For the, those of you who like a little bit of metallurgy, um, these are micrographs of the tap slag, uh, both at the same magnifications, about 460. The white dendritic materials, rather like a backbone there, uh, is, is worstite, FEO, and that's the material which makes the iron in the blue. 
Um, so as in a case like this, we can sort of assess to some degree the efficiency of the process by the amount of worstite that remains. Uh, the micrograph on the right is much coarser, and that's because that slag has solidified in the furnace, so it's cooled much more slowly. All the background material is this iron silicate, which is uh, known as phaolite. And as I said, uh, that, that iron is not available for, um, for further extraction. We have a hot bloom here, which has just been taken out of the furnace. That will still have quite a lot of slag surrounding it. So we start off by gently tapping it uh, on a wooden anvil using a wooden mallet. Uh, so as not to chill it. As we start consolidating it, uh, we start to get more vicious with it. Um, we keep reheating it in, in a small forge that we have on the ground. And um, we then start using steel hammers and anvils in order to consolidate that material. The main products from the Bloomery furnace would have been armaments. This always seems to be the leading uh, aspect of any technology, arrowheads, spearheads, swords, and we have records of you know, so many thousand arrowheads having to be supplied to such and such a place. Body armor, chain mail, sheet armor. So if you go into an ancient house or museum or something like that and you see armor, then nearly all of that armor would have been made from bloomery iron. Horseshoes and ox shoes, very important for transport. Barrel hoops. Barrels were used not only to store liquids, but also uh, for, for foods, particularly on board on board ship. Nails, saws, drills, edges for ploughs, edges for spades. These are all examples of bloomery iron. The raw material, our local ore is a siderite ore, that's an iron carbonate ore, typically around 40% iron content. And the other material is charcoal. The name Weald actually refers to the German uh, name uh, for, for, for a, a forest. And um, there was plenty of wood in the, in the vicinity, which was, uh, was the other raw material. The ore occurs in layers. Uh, on the right, we have a picture of a layer uh, which has been exposed in a local brick quarry. And on the left, we have uh, some idea of the different layers. And this comes from an iron master back in the um, 16th century. Uh, and these names uh, were given. And the, and the quality of the ore varies a lot from area, uh, from depth to depth. So this would have been mined normally with a shaft furnace, which could be uh, three, four meters in depth. Recently, a uh, housing development was being carried out and uh, all the areas had to be checked um, for archaeological remains first. And this was a particular arable field and no sign whatsoever of any mine pits until the surface was stripped off. And then something in the order of a thousand mine pits on a five acre site were discovered. They were per perfectly circular six foot or so in diameter and those were evidently the extraction pits and they average in depth to about 12 feet. Parallel sided, some with slightly inward taper, tapered walls. There were much smaller exploratory pits. On the measurements they appear to be only about a foot in diameter but still going down to 10, 12 feet. So we believe that the edges must have slumped because we can see no way that you could have dug a shaft that narrow to that sort of depth. One of the important things to note is that these pits are not bell pits. They don't open out at the bottom as unfortunately it's been recorded in some of the earlier literature. For all preparation, we wash off the clay, break the ore up into pieces 25 to 50 millimeters or so roughly in size. And that can be hard. So the ore varies an awful lot in hardness depending on the silica content. We heat this up to 800 degrees plus, either in a cover pit or an oil drum. So we have alternate layers of wood and ore and ignite that. And it's very important to cover your roasting pit 
because as the carbon dioxide gets driven off and moisture gets driven off, the ore tends to explode and it can be shooting around like shrapnel. The result in iron oxide is a magnetic form called meghemite. And again, in some of the early literature, people are mistaking this for, uh, uh, for Fe304, the, um, the magnetic form of, uh, uh, of the higher oxide. Because we've driven off the carbon dioxide, we've essentially concentrated that ore and the iron content now goes up to about 50%. And what's very useful to us, it makes the ore porous, which means that it's easier to reduce. The gases from the furnace can get into the pieces of ore. We break that ore up now into pieces 10 to 20 millimeters diameter. We're actually for the smelting, we first preheat the furnace normally the day before and overnight with, with wood. Um, we then charge it with charcoal and we start blowing air in via either uh, via pipe, a tree pipe, using bellows or an air blower. When the top of the furnace, or near the top of the furnace, gets to about 700 degrees centigrade, we start charging ore, normally at one kilogram at a time, and one then one kilogram of charcoal. The usual ratio is one to one, although we do try other ratios. And we continue topping up that furnace as the charge burn downs, typically over a period of about two hours. And then we carry out, um, uh, a, a final burn down by adding some more charcoal to the three charges of charcoal and after about the first hour we do start tapping slag from the base of the furnace and that goes on during that burn down period. This is a section of a bloom and you can see here plenty of iron but also plenty of porosity so we then forge that material uh, on, on the anvil and we produce a billet, and it's this billet which the blacksmith would have uh, used to, to, to make various artifacts. Periods of the Wheel and Bloomery, we've got 690 known sites at the moment, um, of which 217 have been positively dated, largely by pottery, but um, also um, we have had some dated by carbon-14. Um, so, We've roughly got the same number of Iron Age and medieval um, sites. Uh, Roman sites dominate. 62% of the dated sites are Roman. And uh, we've got very few Saxon sites, about 1% or so, three, three of these sites. We've been able to positively identify as Saxon. We now move on to the more later technology, which is the blast furnace. The blast furnace came to the UK in 1490 by technology transfer from the Bologna district in present day Belgium. And immigrants from the Pays de Bray and uh, present day France were invited to set up furnaces by Henry VII. On the illustration that was drawn by one of our members, here's the actual furnace itself. Um, this is driven by a water wheel. Uh, we've got a leak carrying the water in. There's been a water wheel here which drives bellows in the bellows house, which produces a blast, hence the name for the furnace, the blast of air. The hot metal and, uh, uh, and, and slag will come out through the casting house here. Uh, we're charging over a bridge, it's normally at a, a higher elevation to the furnace, and we had a large charcoal store. Um, and the, these were very large buildings because you had to store your charcoal in discrete heaps, otherwise there was a risk of spontaneous combustion. We don't really, well, we've only got one evidence of what a wheel and furnace looked like, and this is on the back uh, of a cast fire back, uh, dating from 1636, where Diane Master Richard Leonard um, showed the tools of his trade and in the corner here a picture of the glass furnace, at least of half the glass furnace, and here's a detail of that furnace. We've got timber reinforcings here and you can just make out, I hope, uh, 
the stone had been cut here to give a, a, a nice surface finish to the furnace. And this is the, the casting arch for that particular furnace. We do have evidence elsewhere of what these furnaces look like. And this is uh, St. Michael's Furnace at St. Hubert in Belgium, which uh, dates from 1771. Here's the furnace itself. This is the casting house. Uh, that's the charcoal store up there and the blowing house would be just behind this area there. Nearer to home, we've got Rockley Furnace uh, near Sheffield, between Sheffield and Barnsley. And um, this isn't a Wallonian furnace, but it does look very similar to, to one. And the interesting thing here is we've got a casting pit in front of the tapping arch, which is this one here. And this was a common feature on the wielding furnaces where they were casting cannon. Here at Rockley, they weren't casting cannon, they were casting rolls uh, for the sugar industry to crush the sugar cane. What we've got left on the wheel here, this is Ashburn and Furnace, which was the very last furnace to operate, operating from 1550 right up to 1813. And this is where the water, this is the, the dam holding the water back here from the pond here. Uh, locally, we call these bays. And the water would have come down here and there would have, in this case, been a breast shot wheel. The earlier furnaces uh, had either back shot or, um, or, 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 or just top, top shot wheels. And this is another example. Uh, we're standing here on the bay, on the dam. The furnace would have been located here. And this is the, um, the, the race that would have taken the water away after it's gone through the, the water wheel. This big bit of pipe here is to protect the bay at the moment because unfortunately it was damaged by uh, agricultural traffic being driven over it. And we're in the process of raising money to repair it. What we tend to find, because it's not a great amount of extinct material available, but we find the slag, the blast furnace slag. And this is a layer of blast furnace slag in the bank of a stream or a small river, actually. And here's a detail of that slag showing um, this sort of glassy nature and all these whirls in it. The, the, the slag on the wheel tends to be very dark, uh, generally very dark greens or, 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 or blacks. But elsewhere, you can get very bright blue sort of azure colors. Uh, of these slags. It seems to depend on the degree of oxidation of the slag. Water, as I said, was the source of the power. These are bellows at that uh, St. Michael blast furnace that have been rebuilt. They've obviously used canvas in this case, but we know on the wheel that they prefer to use um, ox hide in the various inventories that we get. Uh, there's the reference to repairing bellows. This is a picture of, um, from, again, by one of our late members of what um, the casting area of a blast furnace would look like. Here we've got the water wheel, which in this case is a backshot wheel, which is very interesting because in Sweden they built a reproduction uh, early 13th century furnace and um, they were discovering uh, problems uh, with the water splashing into the casting house or around the casting house and you certainly don't want water and hot metal mixing together um, and and they've had to switch to a backshot wheel so uh, we think this is quite logical and here we're illustrating uh, some of the cannons being cast uh, this is a head for the cannon because you have to allow for the shrinkage of the metal as it solidifies cannon balls and so forth. The product from the furnace were either these big sows, um, two to three meters long, weighing anything from half a ton to a ton. And this is what would have gone to the forge for refining. Other products were direct. These are a, a short example of St. Paul's railings, um, where the balustrades here are cast iron and the finals are actually wrought iron. And the interesting thing is we've got the inventory uh, for, for the casting of this, and uh, it records that 270 tonnes were cast at 56 pounds a tonne, which was actually three times the price for casting cannon. And cannon were an expensive thing to cast in the first place. 
And the irony is that apparently Christopher Wren didn't want railings around St. Paul's Cathedral. It was the church commissioners that um, insisted on it. There's a traditional Sussex rhyme that runs Master Huggett and his man John. They did cast the first cannon. And this dates from about 1574 in the reign of, King, of Queen Elizabeth I. In reality, we believe that they probably only cast the breach of the cannon and the barrel itself was wrought iron held together with hoops. That would have been the very earliest of these cannon. Later on, complete cannon were cast. And I'm calling it a cannon, but for the if we want to be pedantic, this is actually a demi culverin and would have fired a ball of about eight to nine pounds in weight. And I don't know if you can quite see it, but on the end of the trunnion here, there's a letter, and each area, each blast furnace of the casting cannon uh, cast a letter on it so it could be identified as the source. Cannon were cast hollow and vertical and then reamed out to make. A relatively true bore. Shot itself was easy to, much easier to cast, and any blast furnace could really cast that. And there was, of course, a great demand for for shot. But for the cannon themselves, we only have about thirty nine um, of the blast furnaces that were able to cast those. The blast furnace process is known as the indirect process, as the iron has to be refined to make it malleable. The, car, the, the iron that comes out of the blast furnace has got about 4% carbon content and it can come out in two forms depending on how you're running the blast furnace. It can be grey iron with, which has got free graphite in it and it's, it's, it's not exactly ductile but you can make usable um, items out of it. But white iron which is extremely brittle and the carbon there is combined as iron carbide or cementite Fe3C, and that is much more suitable for refining in the forge. If we look at the periods over which the, the um, blast furnaces were operating, the blast furnace and the forges, the furnaces are in blue and the forges are in red, then we see this peak from about 1550 to uh, uh, nearly 1700. This is when the majority of activity took place and then it tailed off, came up slowly and then tailed off again. The forges, this is a picture of a um, balloon refining forge uh, dating from 1794 in Sweden and Austria Bebrook and the characteristic thing is that you've got two chimneys here because you had two hearts in the forge and a hammer. So you actually had three water wheels, two sets of bellows, one for each forge, and a hammer. So actually the forges required a lot more power, a lot more water than did the blast furnace. I showed you those long sows that were the iron to be refined, and you can't very well load a, a hearth with a ton of iron, so they had a hole in the back of the wall here which went into the back of the refining hearth and you burnt off the tip of that sow bit by bit uh, and refined it. This is a picture from the Diderot um, Encyclopedia of a forge. We can see here the refining uh, forge with a hole in the back and the sow being fed in. And here's the hammer which is being operated uh, by a water wheel. These cans are lifting up this, this uh, shaft of the hammer and this is a spring to help push it down. If we see one in reality here, um, this, is, um, this is a hammer actually in Sweden but um, we have something very similar for example at Workley Forge just outside Sheffield and a much smaller version um, at Finch Foundry which is a National Trust Foundry uh, near Oakhampton in, in Devon. But uh, the product from these forges were this bar iron. This is bar iron, several meters long, very close dimensions were, were obtained under these anvils, a lot of skill. And this is a sort of material, this would be very low carbon material, less than 0.1%. And this is a sort of material, for example, would have gone for the, uh, the cementation furnaces in Sheffield, 
for making steel to increase the carbon once again uh, by diffusion. If we compare the water powered sites um, with the blueberries, this is in East Sussex because I've been inputting a lot of data from East Sussex here. See this vast concentration of bloomery sites. Normally the bloomery sites are associated with water, but only small streams. You needed water to mix the clay, you needed water to clean the ore, you needed water to, water to refresh the, um, the, the, the people operating the, 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 the bloomery forge. Whereas with the blast furnaces, um, you needed water again, but you needed more water that you could dam to make the ponds to dry to the water wheels. If we look at the different types of powered sites on the wheeled, bloom forges were bloomeries, but they were, wa they were water powered bellows rather than hand powered. And we've got very few of these, and essentially they probably grew into the blast furnace because. As the bloom forges got taller and taller, they got bigger and bigger, they got taller and taller, it meant that the retention time of the iron that was formed near the top of the furnace was much higher. And that meant that it picked up carbon from the charcoal, from the charge. And as you pick up carbon, you lower the melting point. Pure iron melts at about 1550 degrees centigrade. Iron with about 4% carbon, which is blast furnace iron, melts at about 1200 degrees centigrade and this is the reason why you get molten iron out of a blast furnace rather than out of a bloomery. A bloomery can reach those same sort of temperatures, we've measured it with a pyrometer, but, um, but, but it's because of that much higher carbon content of the iron in the blast furnace that's melt, that lowers its melting point that you get molten iron. We have roughly the same number of refining forges as blast furnaces. Um, occasionally, if the pond was big enough, the forge and the blast furnace would be on the same site, but more often than not, the forges were on a different water system, uh, somewhere close by within a mile or so, um, because you had to carry those, those big, big sows across to the forge. Gun foundries, um, we've got a, something like 39 of those, uh, so it was a very specialist area. Boring mills to bore out those guns once they were cast. Uh, fewer of those because one boring mill could, um, could supply uh, several gun foundries. And occasionally, um, well, we've got two brown, bronze foundries because sometimes they use the blast furnace to melt bronze, to cast bronze cannon. The Navy tended to prefer bronze cannon because they were less likely to disintegrate, uh, which occasionally happened with the iron ones. Um, but it was much more expensive and they were actually heavier uh, cannon. Okay, to wind up now, um, Richard Kipling, he was a resident of East Sussex and he wrote, gold is full of mistress, silver full of maid, copper full of craftsman cunning at his trade. Good, said the Baron, seated in his hall, but iron, code iron, is master of them all. And I think that um, gives us a rather brief description of the wheeled and iron industry. Thank you. Tim, thank you very much. That's, that, that's fabulous, particularly this astonishing find of a thousand mine pits in one arable field. <laughs> I, as you say, you wouldn't want to buy a house. I, I wouldn't, no, no. <laughs> they don't warn the builders, but um, that's it. <laughs> Make a great TV documentary in 20 years' time, The Disappearing Housing Estate. Yes, um, yes. On a more serious note, can I have the privilege of the first question? Uh, we've got others coming in. Yes, please. Um, one thing that I used to do as a child was dig out fool's gold from the chalk in Kent near where I lived. Uh, iron pyrites, I guess most people would know it as a, an iron with a very high sulfur content. Did they ever use that as, uh, as ore as well? Yeah, we, we've certainly got evidence um, that the Romans were using it, uh, not so much on the weald, but um, up on the chalk lands in, in Hampshire, for example. I'll just move down 
we have a couple of pictures here. This is weathered iron pyrites uh, in a nodular form. Um, I'll come back to that picture in a moment because I'll show you these are different shapes that you get. This iron pyrites forms a long organic material in in the chalk so you know you might get sausage shape and stuff when we go to various um you know village fates and clarion matches no end of people bring in this sort of material and very often they think it's a fossil or a meteorite or something like that it's very heavy very dense if you split it you get this characteristic radial look and when it's fresh that things looks like gold you know so again people think oh, yeah you know fools go um, but what we discovered that where, where it was being used on the Roman site uh, we were able to collect some samples and analyze them and we found that there was very very little sulfur in it the sulfur had weathered out it had formed in the chalk but the chalk was uh, about 60 odd uh, feet below the current ground level and these were surface finds uh, and, and in fact, you find the staining in the soil around where you do find the nodules. It does help you help you find them. Um, whereas if you get fresh iron pyrites, for example, eroding out of cliff faces that you sometimes find on the cubs, that's still high in sulfur and that would be no good. Uh, one would have thought that you could, by roasting, that material, uh, use it for iron making, but we found that it powdered up to such an extent that it would tend to block up the bloomery furnace. If I just go back to that previous picture, what was more intriguing was that we also found very occasionally, but spread over a wide area, these hematite nodules or kidney stone. Now, normally, this forms in igneous areas of rock. Um, and how the Dickens did it get down to the weald? It wasn't, people didn't just bring it there because, you know, it's been spread all over, you know, the, the, the whole of the weald in area. Rare, but fine signs. So what we suspect is that because the ice um, cap never reached that far south, that it was brought down by meltwater from areas such as Cumbria or, or, or North Wales. But it is intriguing and we're always on the outlook uh, for, for this sort of material. So it probably was never used as an ore because there wasn't sufficient of it. But um, it is quite, quite interesting that uh, we, we do have these little finds of it. Thanks very much. I've got a, a flow of questions coming in uh, and I'm not necessarily not ne going to ask them in the order they came in because one of the questions relates to burden material which is directly relevant to this and Ian Hoos asks was local flux uh, was local chalk used as a flux you didn't seem to mention flux no I, 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 the I iron ore was rich in um, uh, calcium carbonate anyway right and I think here we are Oh. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned flux. That was the other other important aspect with the blast furnace. That by adding the calcium bearing material, that combines with the silica in preference to the iron, so you get a much better yield of, of iron. And there were two types of flux that were used: um, Syrian limestone, and this is this is the lime area here, and this is a bit of ore under it, and this was found. Uh, towards the bottom, it tended to be found at the deeper levels uh, of, of the shaft pits. Um, and that would be a very effective flux. I mean, essentially, you've got a self fluxing ore by yeah. using that material. Uh, it basically, it's, uh, it's shells which are trapped um, with, within the iron ore of high concentration shells. But chalk was certainly readily available from the South Downs in particular and North Downs to a lesser extent. And some of the earlier writings did refer to the use of chalk uh, 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 being charged into the blast furnace. I mean, I oh know it's just a mistake, they must have meant limestone. But we then found a letter in a paper, in a newspaper from about 1850. Um, from the boy of the furnace of that Ash Burnham furnace, which was the last furnace to operate in 1813, and he specifically referred to them charging chalk into the blast furnace. So yes, it definitely was used 
uh, as a flux as well. And in fact, I've tried it in the um, in the bloomery furnace, and it certainly makes the the, the slag flow very much better. I can't say that it obviously gave us a better yield of iron, but it is something we want to go back to and um, try try with a little bit more detail. Well, thank you, Ian, for that question. It rather reminds me of iron making at Scunthorpe in the bad old days when they used to quarry the iron ore locally and get the limestone for free. It's a very similar sort of position, isn't it? Richard Williams is, is online too, and he came up with a really interesting question about the size of sows, pointing out that uh, in, in, the, in the low countries, the sows were much the same size as the ones that you mentioned as being uh, cast, presumably sand cast from the blast furnaces. Was there in effect a, a standard size that was, was traded or what? Um, well, I don't think it was so much that they were traded because you tended to get the same biomaster running both the forge and, oh. the, and the blast furnace. Um, we, I, I mean, again, I've cheated a bit. Those um, sows that I showed were actually from um, Osterbybrook in Sweden. But we have found parts of these, these sows in, um, on the wheeled, uh, one of which is actually about three metres long. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've also you know, found the end, so we know roughly what the cross-sectional area where they tend to be cast in this sort of triangular shape, uh, possibly a bit more triangular than those that I, I showed in the picture. Um, and I think they were probably aiming to, to, to cast as large a sow as they could carry, so something close to a tonne. But obviously, you know, you might be running out of iron, so you might have done, uh, uh, done one, one large sow, and then the second one's a bit smaller because you've simply run out of iron. You know, most of these furnaces could, could only tap uh, maybe up to a tonne at a time. And they'd be run out into beds yes, of into sand, sand, right? yes, into Green it. sand was readily available, of course. Yeah, sorry, what? Green sand was readily available. Oh, yes, it. yes, yes, yes. They would be running out in the green, green sand. Right, well, we've still got... <laughs> uh, this has obviously excited a lot of questions. One that interested me, too, um, uh, from Sue and Mike, what how did they actually bore the cannon what materials did they use because of course iron is a fairly tough material so so how would how would uh, what 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 tools and what materials were used for that process we, we've know? actually found a boring rod and it had a three cutting edges made of steel on it Steel wow. was actually being made uh, on the wheel. Um, in fact, there's a paper in the HMS Journal uh, analysing that cutting cutting uh, rod and the cutting head. But um, yeah, it, it was. And these boring mills generally were powered by a water wheel, and um, it, it would be uh, you know a long a long rod because um, you had to go that right that to the breech of the cannon uh, and of course because of that quite often the bores were not as true as they should be but you know essentially it was a reaming action because you had cast your cannon with a hollow core and you're really just trying to ream out uh, that 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 bore i mean later on of course cannons had to be cast solid um wilkinson um uh, patent uh, required that they were cast, or, and then the Admiralty started to require that they were cast solid. And in fact, that's when basically the wielding cannon industry uh, came to an end because they, they weren't able, well, they decided not to try and undertake casting solid can cannon. So that marked almost the end of their viable technology. Yeah, yes. I mean, it, 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 you know, there was 150 odd years of supplying cannons. So for half the period of the iron industry, they were, were, were still very much the main armaments. I mean, because of the location, you know, we're 50, 60 odd miles from London where 
cannon were proofed. Um, you would load your cannon onto an ox cart, take it to the nearest navigable river, around the coast, and you got to the Tower of London initially, and then later to Woolwich for the proofing. One interesting thing is that we have found what we believe are proof cannonballs on the iron blast furnace sites um, because they would have tested the cannon before they took all that trouble to move them to London. It took maybe mm. up to six months to move them. You couldn't move them in winter because the clay yeah. was far too uh, too soft and wet because of the weight of these, uh, these uh, cannon that you were trying to move. Um, so, um, yeah, they used to, to, to proof the cannon with a small ball and again on the inventories we've got references to the purchase of gunpowder uh, for the proofing of the can. Yes, I recall something in Daniel Defoe's tour through the whole island of Great Britain saying that nothing moved in the wheels in the winter because of <laughs> the mud. <laughs> no. No. Um, there's another really interesting question about the bloomeries themselves. This lovely uh, picture of the experimental bloomery um, second one I think of the generations how was that clay mixed someone asked uh, did you include the uh, ubiquitous cow dung to help the uh, uh, which is after all I believe used in, in bell founding as well to this day yes, yes. Uh, did that did that add strength or what the main reason for adding an organic material in the foundry industry is for the casting because that organic material burns out and oh, right. allows the gases to escape. So certainly mm -hmm. the bulbs for the cannon uh, would have incorporated um, dung of some type, whether it's horse dung or cow dung, and um, uh, that, that would have been the case. In the case of the furnace, you, you don't want your gases to be escaping, you want them to stay in the furnace, sure. uh, A, so that they poison you because it's largely carbon monoxide, but B, because it's there to reduce it. So um, no, um, we we incorporate straw or in this latest furnace hay in order to give it some fibre reinforcement. In that large furnace that I showed, we'd actually had wood and we we, we put vertical sticks and we put um, uh, woven hazel ar around every so often. But when we demolished that furnace, we discovered that actually on one side of the furnace, the wood had burnt out. There'd been uh, a crack in the furnace wall where the tweer had gone in and, um, uh, and the wood had burnt away. So we effectively had a cavity wall furnace there. Um, so in fact, on the latest furnace, we haven't put any work, work, wood in. And certainly from the excavations, we don't find any evidence of wood being added. Uh, but we do find stone. Quite often, some quite large stones have been used, uh, particularly around the base base of the furnace. We have added grog uh, from when we demolished the old furnace. We had some nice burnt clay, so we've added that to try and reduce the cracking. Mm. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. We've just done one smelt in the new furnace so far, so we'll find out. The, the, the first furnace we built, we did 20... Uh, no, sorry, 39 smelts in. That large furnace, we did 16 smelts in it. And we've gone back to a small furnace mainly because the large furnace takes so much to charge. It takes so much ore, so much charcoal, a lot longer to heat it up and so forth. I love the idea that uh, rebar should be made of wood. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on, we've got a question from Rick about the f how did the finery process work? Uh, and he mentions the chaffery. Sorry, he mentions the chaffery. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the finery process was really a question of burning out the carbon. Um, so your bellows were aimed at the tip of the sow as it was fed into the back of the hearth of the refining furnace. And probably in the later stages, they started adding um, iron oxide, um, mill scale, you would have plenty of mill scale around, or rather hammer scale um, from, from around that hammer, and that would help decar uh, decarburize the, the material. Um, but it was a, certainly a very skillful process. In the later hearths, um, there's evidence that they had um, 
uh, an iron sheet, an iron floor to the hearth, and they were water cooled underneath. But the earlier ones, no, yeah. um, it would be purely a, a brick hearth, and then um, it relied very much on the skill of the refiner uh, to, um, to 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 reduce that carbon content. And once that carbon content was reduced, uh, and the the um, loop was taken under the hammer and started to be drawn out into a bar. It would then be reheated in the chaffery furnace, which was a separate um, separate hearth. Again, in the early days, um, using charcoal, but in the later days, uh, coke could be used because this reheating was at a lower temperature, so you didn't risk picking up the sulphur from the coke. That's fascinating because that that suggests a remarkable continuity in 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 iron refining processes doesn't it yeah it, it certainly developed over the years you know as i say the the, the blast furnace era um was 330 years so obviously the technology developed over that period um, ian hooth asks about uh, the melting point of slag from a bro uh, bloomery. I mean, presumably you've got pyrometers and, and you know that. And, and so you must have a very clear idea of what temperatures these bloomery furnaces ran at, do you? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I mean, we use thermocouples um, to record the temperatures. Um, our only limitation is that um, we use an end type which goes up to about... Um, uh, about 1100 centigrade so near the tweer we get much higher temperatures we have to remove the thermocouple because you'll damage it and this is where henry clear had the advantage of a platinum rhodium thermocouple which i have priced and at several hundred pounds i think it was about 500 pounds the last time i priced one the group doesn't feel it's quite justified we we have measured down the tweer with a um a, 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 a lost filament um, uh, um, radiometer and we had measured about 1500 degrees at that uh, sort of temperature unfortunately the damn thing broke on us and we've never been able to get a replacement bulb or sort out uh, to, to, to repair it but yeah we do get very high temperatures and it is possible to get molten iron out of a bloomery furnace but generally it was undesirable because people couldn't then then work it you don't get the quantity to cast it and uh, you just end up with a material which is far too brittle uh, to, 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 to work. Um, as far as the slag is concerned, um, it, it, it depends very much on the composition, but um, a, a high worstite bearing slag, FEO bearing slag, melts at about 1050 degrees centigrade. By adding calcium, by adding chalk, for example, that does lower that melting point. And um, we, we do analyze that slag, and from its composition, we can work out approximately what sort of temperature it would have melted at. But of course, that slag can't be used to exploit further iron because it's so locked in oh, with the silica. Yeah, it's it? not on the wheel. I mean, this is an interesting thing because we know, for example, on the Forest of Dean, they were exporting slag, uh, bloomery slag, to, um, to Ireland for the blast mm. furnaces. And I think the difference is that with the hematite ions, um, the composition of the slag, although it's still got phthalate present, the composition somehow differs uh, because we've got no evidence whatsoever that it was the, the blueberry slag was ever recycled into the blast furnaces uh, on, on the wield. And, you know, we've got good documentary evidence of exactly how these furnaces or some of the furnaces were operated um, people like fuller you know talks about different types of mine which is the ore uh, that were added and if the furnace does this or that or the other you add a different type of ore and so forth and yet there's never any reference to adding cinder as they would call it the slag um, so uh, you know it's, as far as we can tell um, that the the the, the siderite ores um it's either the, the silica content i mean a good good blueberry ore will have say nine percent silica content a poor ore will have about um 
maybe up to 16, we, we find that the ratio of iron to silica must be at least one to uh, or four to one, four times as much iron as there is silica in order to get a bloom. Otherwise, all the iron gets mopped up by the silica. And of course, it was uh, too valuable as road aggregates, as you were saying. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, Tim, we'll, we'll have to, time is pressing, so I, uh, I will have to wrap things up there. But what I think is one of the things that it, it, that's remarkable is the way that you're building up tacit knowledge of how wheeled and iron making worked in its two stages almost from scratch that you've you've gone through all these documentary sources and now you've tried it for yourself and begun to accumulate the kind of tacit knowledge that wheeled and well, iron masters had. Yeah the, the irony is that we're actually not trying to make iron, we're trying to make slag because we're <laughs> trying to make slag which looks like the type of slag that we find sure but of course you've got to make the iron as well because there's no point making a slag which looks right if you didn't make any iron so you've yes. got to be able to make yes. the iron but we we don't we we have had a professional blacksmith forge some pokers and things like that to give to landowners where we've uh, collected ore but um it, it is a slag and, and, and we're trying to produce this sort of fairly dense slag. Of course, the slag we find in the field has been weathered for, you know, could be 2,000 yeah. years. Um, so we can't be sure. But our, our latest attempts at making slag have been, in fact, very successful, uh, very heavy, dense material. And uh, the microstructures are beginning to look much more like what we find in the field. Okay, uh, Tim. I'll have to thank you as a Wilden Iron Master, as well as an accomplished metallurgist. Thank you for a splendid and a beautifully illustrated talk and for volunteering to give it online to us when we we promised to wine and dine you and give you an excellent meal here in Manchester. But no, you're <laughs> you're having to stay put in your own library. Uh, yes, well, thank you very much for allowing me to um, say something about the, the wheeled and iron industry. If we had an online applause, we, we, you, the noise would be deafening. Two quick final points then to everybody. Uh, uh, thank you very much for attending. The next talk, as John said, is on Tuesday, October the 13th on Cold War to Coal Trains, uh, British Rail's TOPS computer system for freight management. I'm afraid you're suffering me on that. Uh, this is joint work with Bob Gwynn. And, and then there's a third talk, as you've heard, in mid-November on, on, on what amounts to Babbage's uh, software. Um, finally, I'd like to embarrass John by thanking John Souter for organising and hosting this talk. And to Anne, who you haven't seen, for acting as technical director in the background and troubleshooting. So I wish you all very well and see you all again in three weeks' time at the Newcomen Shed Lectures. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks to Tim. Thanks to John. Bye for now. <laughs>